Hello, welcome to Bible Suffering Tuesday. I'm so, so, so glad to have you join us this evening. How have you been? I trust everything is well with you and that things are working out for you. But first, I must apologize for Sunday. Sunday, we had a lot of technical hitches and uh, service wasn't broadcasted or was broadcasted, but people were not um, seeing the visuals. Some heard the, got the audio, but some didn't even get any at all. And I must apologize for that. Hopefully today is going hitch free as we trust God that his word will come strong and his word will shine light into our hearts this evening. But I thank you for this evening. I thank you for all the beautiful things that you have done, you were doing and you are set to do in our lives. I ask sweet Holy Spirit that you speak to us this evening, that your word come like hammer to tear down, to break in pieces everything that have exalted itself above the knowledge of Christ in our minds and in our hearts this evening. Sweet Spirit, make your word simple, make it clear. Let your Lord be something, a raw material, a foundation, upon which we are going to build our lives on in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Remember, we are already running a series on steps to answered prayers. And I think I mentioned that we'll be looking at seven of them in this series. We looked at one, I believe, on Tuesday last week. But that one was broken into like four parts you know, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, and all that. And that one actually has to do with what is it that you're trusting God for? What is it that you're believing God for? You know, we are about to step into a new year and we're trusting God for a lot of things. You know, we have our goals, our dreams, our visions, our aspirations, our ambitions, our desires, our wants, our needs, and all those things. So you must decide at every point in time, the thing that you want God to do for you. You must decide at every point in time the thing that you are trusting God for. So that is the first point of call when it comes to faith and believing God for answered prayers. So when you decide on that thing, I said next thing you need to do, you must get the scriptures. The scriptures that support the things you are trusting God for. The scriptures you are standing on on very important then you must get these scriptures not just in your mind you must get these scriptures into your heart getting the scriptures from from the realm of knowledge to the place of rema is what i call the holy spirit reaching into your heart to turn on the light to turn on that switch you know the scriptures in your mind but until it becomes real in your heart, it will not work for you. That is revelation. That is revelation. It is the revealed word. It is the word turned on in your heart that brings the miracle. Not the word in your mind. Not information. Not knowledge. Knowledge and information cannot do the impossible. Knowledge and information cannot change something that appears to be unchangeable. It is Rema that does that. It is Rema that does that. The Holy Spirit turning on the switch. All of a sudden, you see what that word has been saying all this while. Do you have been reading it for a long time? All of a sudden, it just comes alive. All of a sudden, the ignorance of darkness in your heart just dissipates. You know that 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 what the word said in this place, in this particular scripture, is true. It becomes real. All of a sudden, the scales from your eyes drop and you can see clearly. So, you must go Hold firmly on those scriptures, then you must be ready to use those scriptures against the enemy. Like I said, I'm going to show you that's actually the second step. 
And the second step is praying. The second step is now asking for those things. But I'm going to skip getting to the second steps in detail. And I'm going to leave that for probably the first week of, of, of um, January. We're going to look at the different kind of ways we can make our requests known unto God. Then we'll look at also the different kind of ways that we must speak to the situation. At times, we are asking God to do something he has already done. At times, we are praying to God when we are supposed to be speaking to the mountain. So I'm going to show all those different kinds of prayers, possibly first week of January, if the Lord permits us, or maybe second week, depending on when we get there. So the, but that is the second point, bear that in mind. Second point is then pray. Once you've gotten the word, you sat on the word, you've processed the word, you synthesized the word into Rema, next thing you need to do is to ask. What really happens to us is that we hurry to ask, we hurry to pray without first getting the juice out of the word, without first converting knowledge into revelation, without first sitting on the word of God to move it from just head knowledge to revelation. And we just ask, and we ask, and we don't receive, and we wonder why. Because what brings the result is rema, not knowledge. What brings the result is revelation, not logos. Hallelujah. So you ask God for those things that you trust God for. And I gave you a key, a key scripture, Mark 11 verse 24. I said, therefore, I say unto you, whatsoever you ask when you pray, so you must ask and you must pray. Now, this scripture of Mark 11 verse 24 is also important for the third part. It says that when whatsoever you ask, when you pray, do what? Believe that you have received them. So what is the third point? The third point is, as you are coming to pray, believe. You know, I begin to understand why I say you need to spend time in the word. Yes, I understand that situation, situations that happen immediately that require that you pray immediately. So, for those situations, go ahead. Fire that prayer as you are led by the Spirit for emergency situations. But what I'm speaking about here is not, and it's not just for emergency situations. These are for situations, or for these are for things that you are trusting God for maybe in 2022. You must first get the word, sit on the word, Get the juices. I like using that, that word. Squeeze the juice out of the word. Because the process of getting the juice out of that fruit is not automatic. You have to squeeze it. You have to squeeze the fruit so the juice can come out. That same way, you must take the fruit of the word. You must take the seed of the word and crush it so the oil, the juice or whatever is in that fruit will come out. So that process is the process of getting faith. Remember, the Bible says that faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing. Faith does not come from having heard. I'll say that again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. Faith doesn't come from having heard. Yesterday's manner will not do you any good today. Go read about the instruction God gave them about manner. He says, when you get that manner, get just enough for the day. Don't get to store for tomorrow that God will make provision for you tomorrow. Trust him for that. So it is fresh manner for the day. Yes, you know the scripture. Yes, you've heard it. You might even preach from that scripture if you're a preacher. But go back to the word. Read it again. Sit on it again. Meditate on it again. Fresh rema. Fresh insight. New light will be shone into your heart as you do that. Fresh revelation for that situation at that particular time. This is exactly what you need to do. And as you do that, 
faith comes. And when faith comes, you know it. Oh, nobody tells you or nobody will tell you when faith comes. By the time you sit on that word, sit on that word, fresh insight comes. That faith, it is what that now makes you go and pray. So as you go praying, make sure that you believe. As you stand praying, believe. Don't pray without belief. This is exactly what Thomas did. Thomas said, when I see, I will then believe. But Abraham, the Bible says, told us in Romans chapter 3, that he did not tiptoe around the promises of God, but he was strong in faith. Believing, counting him who has spoken as righteous and just to fulfill his promises in his life. That was Abraham's turning point. When he stopped dilly-dallying, when he stopped waiting to receive, when he stopped waiting to see, he believed that which was spoken. That which was spoken is now our written word. When you believe the written word, when you believe the promises of God written in the word, hallelujah, that is when you should ask. That is when you should now pray. Don't pray till that faith has come. Don't pray till you are infused with faith. Wait, wait till faith comes. And how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing, and hearing, and hearing. Fresh manna, not old manna. Not yesterday's food, but today's food. When you receive it in your soul, when that slight switch is turned on in your heart, my brothers, you will know. <laughs> you will know, you will know, you will know. Because all of a sudden, boom, there is light. It's like shining a floodlight in a dark little room every inch of darkness disappears insight comes revelation comes you are infused energized with faith whatever prayer you pray then receives express answer <laughs> this is the step a lot of Christians avoid. This is the step a lot of Christians jump and they wonder why they are not receiving the things promised them by God. They wonder why things are not working out as they have planned it. Because they miss this important step of converting knowledge into revelation. Hallelujah. When you stand praying, believe that you receive them. Believe that you already have the answers. Believe that that miracle has come. Believe that your preferred future is with you already, then the Bible says, when you do that, you will then have them. Never believe for Abrahamic blessings using Thomas's faith. I'll say that again. Never believe for the blessings of Abraham that has now come to us, Christians, Gentiles, using Thomas's faith. Abrahamic blessings only comes to us by Abrahamic faith. Abrahamic faith believed that which was spoken, believed that which was written, even though he has not received it physically, but he believed it. That is why I also put down something here that is so important I want you to note. Know that you have received don't feel that you have received it. I'll say that again. 
know that you have received those miracles. Don't feel like it. I met a lot of people after praying. They come on like, oh, like, oh, I feel it. I feel that breakthrough has come. I feel that God has answered my prayer. I can just feel it. Hey, we are not of those that are moved by feelings. We are not of those that believe because of how we feel. The Bible says we are not moved by what we see. We are not moved by what we hear. We are not moved by how we feel. Faith is contrary to feelings. Faith has nothing to do with how you feel about that situation. Faith has everything to do with God's word. If God's word has said it, if God said, I have done it, if God said, I will do it, that is all you need. Belief. Not feeling. Belief. Not feeling. When you pray, 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 you come out feeling so good. <laughs> and you know what? To anchor your faith on how you feel, my brothers and sisters, you're anchoring your faith on, on endorphins. Endorphins are those hormones released. Especially when you do some physical exercise. At times you pray, you jump, and do some gymnast. And your body releases endorphins. Endorphins will not bring the result. Endorphins is not faith. It is just hormones. Don't put your faith in your hormones. Don't put your faith in how you feel. Put your faith in the word of God. You may even feel drowsy and dull. But once there is the light of that word on your inside, that has injected faith, stand knowing that it is done. You may be feeling sad and weak. It does not change it. It does not change the word of God. It does not change your faith. Once you know that you know that you know, whether you don't feel like it, it is done. It is done. Put your faith in God's word. Put your faith in what he has said that he will do or he has done. Don't put your faith on how you feel. Feelings change, but God's word doesn't. You might feel good after prayers <laughs> and you get home <laughs> and you see those evil situations, <laughs> those sad circumstances. <laughs> what now happens to your feelings? <laughs> a man and a woman of faith, we still see depressing situations all around. <laughs> we still see that those things they are trusting for is everywhere around them, <laughs> but they don't shake <laughs> because we are not moved. <laughs> by how we feel. We are moved by the word of God. When we see those things still present, you still feel the pain in your body. You still feel that sickness. Your sons and your daughters are still misbehaving. Your money in the account is not there. It is still in negative. All those situations, your relationship that you trust God for, is not there. You don't go crawling under your duvet and wondering, but God, I believe you this 2021. What has happened? We are not moved by what we see. We are not moved by how we feel. We are moved by the word of God. Ask yourself, what did God say about this situation? What did God say? And anchor your faith on it. I refuse to bulge. I refuse to shake because he is faithful who has promised. Hallelujah. <laughs> a revelation of that scripture alone keeps you sane. A, a revelation of that scripture alone gives you certainty of faith. You don't shake. You don't bulge. You don't move. Hallelujah. So, somebody might ask, then, how do I know that I have faith? How do I know that this faith has come so I can ask? Oh, glory be to God. I'll just show you one or two and probably continue next week. I don't want 
our Bible sufferings to be too long nowadays. How do you know that you have faith? Number one, do you overuse that phrase, I am believing God for this. I am believing God for that. Do you overuse it? A lot of people overuse that phrase. I am believing God for, they keep saying it, I'm believing God for this, I'm believing God for a miracle, I'm believing God for a job, I'm believing God for this. And some people, they think that when they keep using that phrase, that they have faith. <laughs> for some people, they think that when they keep using that phrase, that faith will come. The Bible never said that faith comes by saying that you have faith or that you are believing God for something. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that faith comes when you hear the word of God. So don't assume that you have faith because you're using this phrase. Faith comes by hearing and hearing on God's word. And like I said earlier, don't depend on yesterday's manner. You have to get fresh manner for that day. Let's look at the scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. The Bible says, examine yourself whether ye be in the faith. It says, prove yourselves and know ye yourselves. I like the way uh, um, NLT puts it. Say, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourself. Now, how do you test yourself to know if you are walking in faith or not? How can you tell if you are walking in faith or not? There are different things which I call enemies of faith. You know, Paul spoke to Timothy and spoke to him about the fight of faith. A lot of preachers I've heard have said that the fight of faith is the fight to get faith. That is not entirely true. Uh, that, that's not my focus today, to disprove that. But the fight of faith, when it comes to trusting God for the things that you want, that you, you want to receive from him, is not fight to get faith. It is the fight to ward off doubt. To ward off these enemies of faith. Doubt, worry, anxiety, fear. You must kick them out so your faith will have a beautiful environment to flourish. They are like the weeds that try and struggle for nutrients with your plant and your seed. If you're a farmer, you understand what I mean? When you plant your seed, your yam, your cocoa yam, your millet, your apple, whatever you've planted, some strange weeds that you did not plant find themselves growing and competing with the same nutrients that your plants are supposed to nourish themselves with. So they come to that ground like weeds. Jesus called them paths. And they're competing with the same nutrients. Whenever you're trusting God for something, worry at times comes. At times we, 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 we focus so much on our troubles that we make them so, ele we elevate them so much that it becomes so big in our perception. Do you know why? When you focus on your troubles, you magnify them. Anything you focus your thoughts, your mind on, gets bigger. So what Satan does, what the enemy does, is that he brings worry, fear, anxiety, doubt. So when you start engaging in those activities, you make that problem appear bigger than it should be. 
And whatever takes the bigger size usually wins the battle of your soul and your mind. So, you must fight this fight or fit by examining yourself. Are you worried that this problem might overwhelm you? Are you fearful? Are you anxious? Oh, why would it happen? Oh, it's not happening. Oh, this problem is getting bigger. Oh. Are you in unbelief? Are you actually doubting if God's word is really true? Examine yourself to check if this, I think there are five of them. Worry, anxiety, fear, doubt, unbelief. If they are present. If they are present, listen to me carefully. It does not mean you don't have faith. It only means that these things are going to stifle your faith. They are going to weaken your faith. And weak faith cannot produce results. Jesus talked to us about that. He said to the disciples, you are, you are, you are, you are weak in faith. That is a ye faithless generation. You know? So, it might stifle it. It might stifle it. Does not mean it will stop the miracle. What you need to do, like a wise farmer that wants harvest, at the end of the day, is to weed out the farm. So he comes periodically, walks through his farm, and starts weeding out those weeds. He starts taking them out. You start taking them out. This is how you fight the fight of faith. You start weeding out fear. You start weeding out um, 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 anxiety, uh, worry, unbelief, doubt. And how do you do it? By countering those emotions with the word of God. That's the only way. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the more you hear what God's word has said, fresh manna, it, you stifle doubt of the nutrients he requires. Because doubt means worry, means fear. You stifle unbelief. So the more of God's word you get, and the more you meditate on those words of God, you are now fighting the fight of faith. You are now weeding out those five elements, those five weeds. In some cases, you may need to constantly confess that word. You may need to constantly speak that word. The more you speak it, the more you confess it, you are killing those weeds. <laughs> See, the, what is it called? Is it weed, weed sites? Weeder sites. You know, like insecticides. There's a word for it. The word of God, meditating on God's word, it's like a weed aside to the weeds. It's like um, a weed repellent, for lack of a better word, to those five things. The cure of the five enemies of faith is the word of God. It is the word read. It is the word meditated upon. It is the word spoken and declared. That is how you get rid of this. Because those, that worry comes like a thought. And thoughts are countered by speech. Say that again. Thoughts are countered by speech. At times, when you are so obsessed with worry, it might just be time to carry out a confession session. You take those scriptures. You start confessing it. You start declaring it. You start personalizing it. As you do it, you will notice that worry goes. Anxiety goes. Fear goes. Because where God's word is present, faith comes. When faith comes, fear cannot stay. Hallelujah. 
Can I squeeze in one more? Can I squeeze in one more today? I think I can. Glory be to God. Number two, how do you know you have faith? How do you know? Number two is what are you standing on? What are you standing on? Ken Higgins, I said he has conducted this research severally. When he meets people trusting God for something, he always asks them, what scripture are you standing on? He said 80 out of 100 times, that is 8 out of 10 people, will always say to him, scripture? No scripture. I just believe God for this. I just trust God for this. And he said, that's exactly what you're going to get. If you don't have any word of God you are standing on, if you don't have any scripture that you are holding on to as the anchor of your faith, you will get absolutely nothing. So it is essential that whenever you are trusting God for, or whatever you are trusting God for, you must have your key scripture that you are standing on as an anchor of your faith. When a ship berths at port, they will always drop anchor. If they don't drop anchor, that ship will be taken by the waves into any direction. What ensures that that ship stays at that particular point in the port is the anchor. Is the weight that is lowered into the sea. Whatever you believe God for, get an anchor for your faith. Get a scripture that you're standing on. If not, you will get nothing from God. He said, it is impossible to please God without faith. And faith comment by hearing the word. So you can't tell me you have faith and there is no word you are standing on. Real faith has a foundation. That foundation is what you heard from God and not what you heard from man. Holy Spirit, do I still have time? That foundation of faith is what you heard from God, not what you heard from man. I'll explain. See, what we are doing is preaching. We are exhorting. We are building your faith. We are actually pointing you to the direction where the faith comes, the source of faith, which is the word of God. And that's what I always do whenever I preach. But a lot of people, when they preach, they turn the people's eyes to them. They turn the people's eyes to them. And there are some scriptural backing for that as well. You know, just always say, look at me. Just always say, do you believe that I can do this? Just always say, if do you, do you have faith that I can do this? He's turning the people's eyes on him. There's scriptural backing on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the focus of anyone that is trusting God for something should be God. We are men. We are used as conduits. We are used as channels for God to bring that miracle to you. We are not the creators of those miracles. We are not the source of those miracles. We are just channels. And as Christians, as teachers of the word, as preachers, we must recognize our role and not turn the eye of man towards us. We should always turn the people's eyes towards God and his word. Their faith should be in God and his word, not on that man. Hallelujah. Hope you understand what I mean. So, this is why this number two is very important. What are you standing on? It must be God and his word, not man. And the same thing that I want to say about this, and that is testimonies. I love testimonies. 
testimony reassures me of God's power, strength, and ability. Testimonies reassures me of God's word when he says that his promises will not fall to the ground, that his word will not fall to the ground until it accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. That is what testimonies does to me. But I've seen men and women that have not anchored their faith on testimonies. Instead of anchoring their faith on the man that brought those testimonies, on God that delivered those miracles. So I've seen men that say, oh, that they heard this testimony. This person did this and did that. I'm going to go and do this and do that, that that person did so I can get the same miracle. But it is never in the word of God to do that. You won't find it anywhere in the word of God that I do what so and so person did so you can guess that person's result. No. What you see in the word of God is oh, oh believe the promises of God. Testimonies are important. Let me explain what testimonies are. In those days, you know, growing up, we used to have all sorts of cars that <laughs> were in their last years of life. At times, we might forget to turn off the internal lights in the car and we leave the light bulb on all night. When we now come out in the morning to start the car, the car won't start. Do you know why? The light you left on has run down your already weak battery. So all night, the residue power and energy that would have started your car in the morning and allowed your alternator to charge your car while you're driving it has been depleted. So what happens? We get people, neighbors, <laughs> please push, push, help me push. <laughs> So as they push your car, you do what we call jump starting the car. So as the car gathers a little bit of motion and speed, you engage your clutch, accelerate, and the car starts. Then you leave the car on for a while so the alternator can charge the battery. That force that your neighbors added to get the car into motion is what testimonies are. <laughs> At times you might feel so faint. You might feel so weak in that thing you're trusting for. You might need just a push <laughs> because your battery has run down. So God does miracles and tells people, come and testify. Why? There might be somebody in the audience, in the congregation, that needs a push. Or another way of explaining it is like getting a jump cable. Instead of pushing the car, you get a jump cable, connect the battery from this car to your battery, then you start the car. But guess what? You cannot leave that jump cable there <laughs> all through the day. No, you can't go about your business with another man's battery. You can't. You can't. It simply does not work. What they just did is to spark, <laughs> is to add spark to your plugs so your car can start. It's like giving you inspiration. It's like give, exhorting you just to get you started. That's exactly what motivational speakers do. There's a difference between a motivational speaker and a preacher. A preacher installs the engine. He stores the battery, connects all the cables and wires that will enable you in your house without the preacher to start your car and go about your business and get things done. That's what preachers do. The motivational speakers just come to add a push to ignite your fire. Is it important at times? Yes, it is. That's exactly what testimonies do in church as well. So when you say, ah, this person testified that they did this and they got this, I am going to go and do this to get this, 
you might not get the result. Why? The Bible says something in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Get that scripture. And this is where I'm going to stop. 1 John 5, verse 14. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, his will, his word, the things he has spoken to us, not the things he told another man to do, and the man did it and got his miracle, and he want to go and do damn God's will for that man, expecting your miracle to come that way, it might not come. Because you need to sit on God's word for yourself. You need to hear from God yourself. And God will give you your own specific directions in accordance with his will. It is your own manner. It is your own instruction that will deliver your miracle. Don't copy another man's manner. Don't copy another man's instruction. Deploying it in your life and expecting a miracle. What testimony does is to tell us, hey, God is a good God. God is still in the business of working miracles. If I trust him, I will get my own miracle. Don't put your faith in men's testimonies. Put your faith in God. And his word. A man of time, I need to stop. I'm going to continue from this point next week, Tuesday. So don't miss it for anything. Don't miss next Tuesday for anything. Join me on Tuesday, same time, same platform, as we take this journey so that when we start praying in January, <laughs> when we start praying in January, we will pray a right and not a miss. <laughs> when we start praying in January, we will get answers to our prayers. We will get answers to our prayers. But I thank you for your word. I'm super grateful, Holy Spirit, that you delivered your word the way you wanted it delivered. I know the hearts of men and women that have heard this word is burning within them. The fresh insight has come as regards prayers of faith. For these ones, Lord, they are stepping into a realm where they will no longer experience prayer failures. As they pray, they will receive. As they ask, they will receive. As they desire, they will get. There shall no longer be prayer failures in their lives. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Father, for those that have an offering, I pray for their offerings right now. Bless them. The ones given, bless them. Increase them. Multiply them. In the name of Jesus. Let those things that they are trusting you for come to them speedily. In the mighty name of Jesus. Join us tomorrow for prayers. Or don't miss our prayers. You want to join our prayers? Send a message to us. Go to our website, activatechurch.co.uk. At the bottom, you're going to see a chatbot. Send us a message through that chat. Say you want to join prayer meetings. And we'll send you the Zoom link. Our prayer meetings are not online. We only hold them as a family on Zoom. So we'll send, we'll send you a Zoom link with which you can join our prayers. I love you. I'm going to see you tomorrow. Go succeed. Go prosper. For God is with you. Amen.